Hi, I'm uh, Rikke Jacobsen, the CEO of Cannabis Danmark, and you're now listening to Professionally Cannabis. Where do they go? The smoke rings I blow each night. Oh, what do they do? Those circles of blue and white. Good morning and welcome to our dedicated listeners. You're joining us for another episode of Professionally Cannabis. I'm Oscar Hausman and with me is my co-host Johnny Weiser. Hey there, Oscar. Listeners, today is a special day because I've got Oscar a present. Here you go, brother. We've been talking about this one for a while, ever since you went to Greece, so I'll open it up. And it is a t-shirt with (laughs) something that I probably can't repeat on this show. Well, I suppose we're the producers, right? It says, <laughs> Oedipus, the original motherfucker. Live reactions, Oscar, what are your thoughts? <laughs> well, it's factually correct. I don't know of any earlier motherfuckers than Oedipus. And as someone who took three years at university painfully studying ancient Greek, this, this about sums it up. <laughs> awesome. Really glad you liked it. Now, moving on to something else our listeners might like. This week's interview is with Reika Jakobsen. She is CEO of Cannabis Denmark. Me and Oscar actually met her face-to-face out in Copenhagen a couple of months ago. She's a bit of a rock star, no? Yes, she is. Cannabis Denmark's doing great things. And they're actually working on a policy paper when I caught up with her a couple of weeks ago, which they're just going to release straight away into English because they know how much the rest of the world's been following Danish cannabis regulation. I've I've been saying for a while now that they're really interesting because they've got a patient-led perspective and they're also trying to build the right environment for companies to thrive. Admittedly, it's a four-year test program, but we've got reason to think that will stick, right, Johnny? 100%. Not only being a really progressive program as far as European cannabis goes, but it seems to be that in Denmark they have real political support on both sides of the fence. This is really important as well because only a few weeks ago they had uh, an election in Denmark. There are likely to be ministerial changes and knowing that there's support on both sides of the fence means that we can pretty much say that this program is going to see its way through to the end. Excellent. Well, without further ado, let's hear from Reka herself. Oh, what do they do? Those circles of blue and white. I'm delighted to say that this week's interview is being recorded live in Copenhagen at a conference. Today we're speaking with Reika Jakobsen, CEO of Cannabis Denmark. Now, Reika is one of the pioneers in bringing cannabis to Denmark. They've got a really progressive program and one that could well provide the benchmark for many other European countries when rolling out their cannabis programs. Reika, we're delighted to have you with us. Thank you. Now, one of the questions we like to ask all our guests on Professionally Cannabis is what led you to the plant? I feel this answer may be a little bit different coming from a policy perspective rather than our traditional business one, but still very interesting to hear nonetheless. It really started in uh, 2013 uh, with my father, who had uh, prostate cancer, and we uh, have read about uh, medical cannabis, and uh, he he said to me, Rikke, should we try this, and uh, could it be safe for me? And I said, I don't know. Let's try it. And I bought it actually in the UK uh, on the illegal market and later on uh, another country. And the first batch worked very well from the UK. Uh, and, uh, and the second one didn't work. And the first one, while the first one worked, he got his appetite back. He uh, had the nausea from uh, his uh, chemotherapy. But uh, when he got the second, it didn't work at all. And uh, he died uh, at last and uh, suffered a great deal at uh, at the end because we didn't have the right cannabis. But uh, that's why I went into this area, because I don't want patients to be criminalized and I want them to have a product that they can rely on. So uh, I was one of them to, one among others, to form an association called uh, Medical Cannabis Denmark and uh, start lobbying uh, for this uh, trial we have today. And later on, we uh, Medical Cannabis Denmark merged into 
today's uh, cannabis Denmark, uh, where I'm the CEO. So it was activism which turned into governmental work. Yeah. Yeah, uh, it was. Is that the first time in the world that's happened? I don't know anywhere else. Because I have uh, 25 years uh, of a uh, political background in the uh, organization, I knew that I uh, just can't stand on the sideline and, and provide politician with the history from the patient's uh, suffering and so on. You, you have to approach it another way too. You have to lobby and you need uh, also, because that was my goal, to have research in Denmark in medical cannabis. And because I want that, I also need cultivating in Denmark because they have to develop the product to specific diseases. So uh, I um, talked to our uh, food and uh, agricultural organization here in Denmark, which is huge, and uh, told them about all this and what's happening around the world. And they could see, okay, there could be uh, some uh, business for us here and also we could help the patients. So uh, they helped me to lobby. It through. And uh, at the same time, we had an actress called Sus Elin, who is very popular in Denmark. And uh, she uh, formed this organization, Cannabis Denmark, and, and, and got me into it. Uh, and uh, also with, uh, with my good friend, uh, Marianne Heuger, who, who has uh, a pain illness, which is very rare. And together we formed a new board for this uh, organization. And... Uh, the rest of this is history. We are in the middle of it right now and uh, and uh, provide information from uh, all stakeholders, from plant to patients, and also collect uh, information from abroad uh, and try to push this forward all the time. We're hearing great things about the Progressive Program coming out of Denmark, but for folks that are less familiar with your organization, Cannabis Denmark, would you be able to tell us a little more about the trial program that you guys are rolling out? People don't realize it took some years. And the first proposal in uh, our parliament was in uh, 2015. And from there to last year when we got this program, there have been some couple of years where the government, the authorities have to collect information from abroad and uh, do our own kind of scheme here in Denmark. Uh, the best of uh, all the countries from Canada, from Netherlands, from uh, Italy, and uh, do our own scheme. And we keep on pressing, pressing, pressing. When will it happen? When will it happen? And uh, really, I think uh, what we got is uh, pretty okay. If you look around in the world, you don't have the perfect anywhere. But what we could see at the start, it, uh, from the start, we, we had prescription the first day. And the uh, doctors, okay, there was some resistance. In every country, there's a resistance from the, the healthcare community. And we have uh, the doctor association put on uh, uh, sent papers around uh, where the uh, stood uh, we don't prescribe cannabis in uh, uh, in our house. Uh, it, it was in the windows and the doors, so patient couldn't even get to communicate with the doctors. You have that in the UK, unfortunately. Yeah, the first thing is to get to the doctor and talk about it. Perhaps the doctor don't want to prescribe it. But they have to say why they don't want to prescribe it. They owe it to the patients. That's the first step. And if they don't want to prescribe it, then tell them where they can, to a specialist or something else. So that was actually something I wanted to touch upon. One of the issues in the UK is that, albeit medical cannabis has been legal since November, there's very, very low levels of education for clinicians in this specialist area, which has led to only a very small handful of NHS prescriptions being handed out and only a few more private prescriptions. With regard to the programme that you're rolling out in Denmark, how are you guys ensuring patient access? We don't have education uh, uh, yet, but we co- collect uh, side effects from the, the program. And the first year, uh, our medical agency looked at the figures and uh, said to us, yes, it's safe to prescribe. That's the first step for every doctor. This is safe to prescribe. My patient won't be harmed with the, the uh, medical cannabis. The effect will come later. To measure the effect or to uh, clinical research in effects, must come later. That, that That's my point of view. And also the authorities, also the politicians' point of view. This has to bo- go hand in hand because we're so behind. So when the doctors know 
that this is safe pr- to prescribe, we can have the research in hand in hand with the prescription. So how did you get the evidence that it's safe to prescribe? Because in the UK, there's lots of controversy around things like psychosis, prefrontal cortex uh, development. Yeah. Uh, we have a CPR system in Denmark uh, uh, where every where the doctors have to inform uh, our medical agency if uh, if there's some side effects. Uh, either the patient inform the doctors or the patient inform uh, our medical uh, agency itself. And uh, that's how we collect uh, the side effects. And th- there's no serious side effects. It's dizziness and uh, dry mouth, as you probably he- heard uh, about everywhere else. We have one or two serious side effects, but it's, uh, it's uh, because of uh, wrong dosing. The patient misunderstood the dosing. Was the onus more, unfortunately, on the patient's side, or was the incorrect dosage prescribed by the clinician? The correct dose was to, uh, prescribed, but the patient misunderstood it, apparently. Yeah, it happens, and it wasn't more serious that, the, that the, you know, when it's THC, a couple of hours sleep, and you have a great time again. Yeah. Since rollout of the trial, do you have any statistics about patient access that you might be able to give us? Yeah, the the latest figures uh, comes from our Ministry of Health today, <laughs> actually, <laughs> because I haven't seen the figures before. 2,000 patients right now, a little over 2,000 patients, and uh, was it a little about over 400 doctors, and uh, mainly now it's uh, GPs, which is uh, surprising, uh, and uh, because before it was specialists, but now the GPs ahead of prescribing is. And I think it's due to what, what, what tools do I have uh, to uh, neuropathic pain to my patient? Those tools I have now, it doesn't work. Now we're trying the new tool, medical cannabis, because it's safe to prescribe. What would you say to political figures that might be listening to this? And what can other countries and other governments learn from the Danish experience? It all comes down to working together, I think, uh, between sectors, as we did, uh, and uh, have a communication all the time with the industry, with the patient organization, we an independent uh, interest organization, with the researchers. What they didn't do in Denmark was to uh, get the advice from the uh, medical community. And uh, and it took some time to get over, and uh, that's why the recession was so forceful. But uh, I think they should uh, reach out for for those in the the medical, um, the doctors and the, the physicians that are in favor for this, or not not against it, because that's what happened in Denmark. We had uh, particularly one uh, doctor uh, specialized in in pain medicine, Tina Horstel, and uh, and she was on board. And today, uh, because we have so much research in medical cannabis, within a year we got, uh, I think, about 14 or 15 studies where I think four or five is a clinical standard with the high standard with the placebo and, uh, and everything. Yeah, within one year. So we have uh, this uh, clinical cannabis formed by uh, researchers in Denmark, uh, and uh, they are. Uh, the, the spokesman is uh, very progressive in this area and uh, very keen to get on and on and on. Lucky enough, we have those people to drive it forward. And where did these guys get their funding from? This network, uh, cannabis, uh, clean, clinical cannabis, from uh, don't get funded anywhere. It's uh, voluntarily, totally. Uh, and of course, the, the clinical research are getting funded, but not by the so much by the industry. It's more like a, a governmental or uh, from their own university, yeah, or funding by the pharmaceutical funds. The Nordis have a fund going into this. Uh, Lundbeck have a fund. They are now a little bit interest in in the area and said to us. If there are some uh, research or study we can uh, support and you have a paper on it, uh, then we will uh, look at it. We've talked about a lot of stakeholders here, but we haven't mentioned the cannabis industry, the Danish one in particular. I know there's 15 development license holders. How have they been interacting with you on this front? Yeah, we uh, interact great uh, with the industry and we have to. We have to because we have to work together on this issue because it's a so small pharma area still. So we have to cooperate. 
or from the bio chain to from from the plant to the patients, because uh, then we w- won't get further on. And uh, and I know they want to uh, to fund the research. Uh, no doubt about that. It's just uh, how to have the right protocol, what kind of research, uh, because we are not doing any research in the whole plant yet. We only d- uh, do research in single molecule THC and CBD, or those two together. That's how far we are come if you want to high, have the high standard. And also I can see around in, in, when you get to the phase one, two, three, you have the single molecule, except for Israel and autism. And, uh, and I think also in the, the states with the, the PTSD research. Yeah. But they, they have uh, in THC and brain, brain tumor now. Very exciting because we have this, uh, Spanish research team in 10 years and not uh, because a uh, lack of funding, they, they couldn't get further with it. I think GW did one as well, testing cannabinoids with TMZ for glioblastoma and extending life expectancies from 500 days to something like 900 days. But I'm looking forward to the phase two uh, research uh, doing in, in Australia with the THC and brain tumor. And it will be a major, major impact on uh, the cancer. Uh, industry, uh, pharmaceutical industry, if we can prove that uh, cannabinoids will help decrease uh, tumors. One of the things I was really keen to ask about is a political landscape in Denmark. Is there cross-party support for the cannabis program? And if there happened to be an election called in Denmark, what impact would that have on the future of your trial program? Yeah, the lucky thing in Denmark is the support from all parties. So uh, so that's a lucky thing, especially from the two biggest those in in uh, government now and uh, also the 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 biggest party right now uh, social democrats so even though uh, there will be a change of government and i don't know if there will be but uh, we will see because we have an election around the corner <laughs> and uh, it it will con- continue because everything is supportive both in the uh, for the industry sake and uh, for the patients uh, side sake so uh, nothing uh, will happen. Only that we will, of course, see because it's a try period. So there will be uh, some adjustment along the way. And uh, when we are finished with the four uh, try period, it will be a permanent program with the adjustment and all the learnings we had done in the, these four years. So uh, I'm not uh, afraid uh, when this uh, terms. Uh, is ending. We will see a lot of patients and a lot of doctors and uh, a program where we can educate uh, physicians. Uh, we have some in pipeline too uh, with the education. So um, yeah. Does the trial program look to continue as is? Uh, because in cannabis, four years seems almost uh, a lifetime for the industry. Wow. So will a trial in two years' time be as good as or similar to now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have already uh, just in one year change some some of the laws uh, adjust them uh, in in particular uh, in the cultivation uh, we got al- also the export bill and uh, and uh, something else for sale yes uh, the bill for sale also so there's a small adjustment ar- uh, along the way and uh, there will be some more i think the uh, next year and for cultivation, can you talk us through the process? Let's say I'm a farmer and I want to get up and running. What do I actually need to do to make that dream a reality? You can start on your own with your own company, foreign company, go into Denmark, but you don't know, really know uh, about the Danish law <laughs> or you don't know the Danish approach. So uh, those who are starting uh, by themselves without a joint venture or investment in, in Danish companies, they have a Danish uh, one guy or woman uh, employed to take care of these things. And uh, then uh, either do you uh, le- make a joint venture on investment uh, in a, a greenhouse, for example, uh, you need a lawyer. And, uh, and of course, you need to talk to the, the authorities, local authorities, who is uh, very helpful regarding is in the, in Odense or in Vibro or all the Danish uh, small small uh, cities they are very very helpful because it, of course it's investment in the city <laughs> so they they like that they help in any way uh, and um, depending where your company will be there's a high standard of education among the employees 
because also we have huge uh, a medical industry, uh, Novo, Nordisk, Lundberg, and, and so forth. So we have uh, high educated uh, uh, employees uh, in this matter. So that's what we can help with, all uh, because we have all the network. So uh, we can uh, do a whole list of what to do step by step by step. Yeah. For investors and financiers that might have a spare few dollars or kroners to put into the cannabis industry, what's your plug for Denmark? We are a very liberal country, even though uh, our medical agency is very harsh in the standardization. Our communication between sectors is very high, and we can talk to the politician. For instance, I can talk to our Minister of Health. Uh, and uh, call the police uh, if we want uh, any advice from them or the medical agency, even though we are up north. <laughs> our energy is not that expensive. It's uh, pretty much low. And then it's uh, you can quick get all paperwork done regarding land, uh, regarding uh, joint ventures and uh, everything. What I hear, if we compare us to other countries, that uh, even though we think our medical agency is so slow, so slow, comparing with other countries, they are not slow. They are so fast. <laughs> so uh, the unbureaucratic communication lines in Denmark are so good. Yeah. Uh, and the other thing, we talk. We talk. E- the, even we have uh, a row and uh, canopy in, in forms of uh, spectrum. They talk together. They, they are competitive, but, but the, here in Denmark, what we have to agree on, we agree on, to help each other uh, make the business. And that's what we see among all the producers here, because we have uh, our sponsors that uh, meet five times a year and uh, talk together and uh, how we could agree on uh, what we should advise the 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 ministry of health and uh, and uh, other uh, ministries uh, what to do in this area what we can agree on uh, in terms of uh, education of uh, of physicians and and so on so on they have to talk together and it's uh, working pretty well so related to that are there any other european regions or, in fact, anywhere else in the world, you would like to enact something of their regulation or their regime, their way of doing things? Or have you got everything you want? No. I would like an institute like they have in Israel, the Cannabinoid Institute, uh, Technion. I would like the similar thing in Denmark. (laughs) 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 I have heard David Miri, who is uh, in charge of it, and he is... He's so right. That's the way to approach uh, research in uh, cannabinoids and medical cannabis. Their research is top-notch. Yeah. They've done strain-specific research. Yes, and that's the way to do it. It's exactly the way to do it. Something related to that is the question around all the products now only talking about THC or CBD levels. What we're doing about the 140 other cannabinoids that could have potentially life-saving effects. How do we get them on the curriculum? So it is the same. We have to uh, go a step back. And it's also what I said uh, uh, in uh, my session uh, today. We have to go a step back and uh, rethink. And it, it could become uh, the thing to do after this uh, four-year trial or uh, incorporated in uh, our four-year trial to collect uh, all the products uh, from uh, our scheme uh, here in Denmark, from all the producers, and compare it to uh, each uh, patient and illnesses. Does this work? Does this work? Does this work? They can do it uh, in Israel. Of course, we can do it in Denmark too. And we uh, have, unfortunately, the, the surveillance of all the uh, patients and people. <laughs> but it's good when it's collecting data <laughs> for the me- medical purpose. Uh, so, uh, so it's very easy to do it in Denmark. And uh, hopefully we can get it, but it costs millions. So and and the industry can uh, can use it because uh, it's ground research and they can see okay this strain with this uh, content it works for this illness maybe I should uh, try to do some phase trials in this because it's very p- promising to just this uh, illness so uh, so the industry can uh, use it too and does Denmark have that variety of strains that would allow that. Not yet, because right now we are importing uh, cannabis, but uh, 
Within two years, uh, we 15 products with all those uh, cultivators in Denmark. I, we will end up with 50 products in Denmark, I'm sure of it. They have to sell it in Denmark before they can export it. So we are a small country, so we will be flooded with cannabis. And flooded with cannabis might make some people who are against cannabis, especially those who see medicinal cannabis as a gateway for recreational, as something to worry about. How do you see the future of recreational cannabis in Denmark, or Europe for that matter? Um, uh, and we're only working with the medical side of it, but uh, but we can't avoid that uh, in, in, in some time, in about four, five, six years, I don't know how many years, it will become. Regard we want it or not, because uh, the, the, the bricks will fall uh, around in Europe, so uh, it will come. I got one uh, advice, actually from Aroa in Canada. She said, because of the Canadian uh, adult use now, she said, Maggie, you have to get the endocannabinoid, all the endocannabinoid learnings into the medical school before we get anything recreational in, the, in the Europe or in Denmark. If you got it in school, then you're as secure with the medical cannabis. So that's the way to go <laughs> before. <laughs> yeah, it's a race against time. Yeah. So you'll get the education minister on the podcast. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For listeners who aren't so versed in Reka's work, so we're recording this podcast live from a cannabis convention in Copenhagen. And I think it would be fair to say you're somewhat of a rock star here. Is it true? I think so. Is it true? I think you're pretty clearly dressed like a rock star. I'm, I'm turning 50 this year. <laughs> yeah, but being a rock star is a state of mind. Look at Mick Jagger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and with regards to your illustrious career, once the cannabis program is fully up and running in Denmark, and once you think your work is done, what next for you personally? Do you see yourself taking some sort of pan-European advocacy position? Am I already trying to? I'm already trying to, uh, what I talked to, uh, several, uh, of the participants today. I, I said we, we have to talk with the EU on the difficult to trade, uh, across the borders. They don't have, uh, approached, uh, the medical cannabis issue, uh, not at all. Only the cannabis based issue. And uh, they, it's, uh, Sativex, uh, Epidolex, and uh, it's, uh, if they only want to, to throw money in uh, in uh, cannabis-based uh, medicine uh, research for that, we can wait 10, 20 years before we help the patient. So uh, already now, I'm uh, I'm trying to gather people or to see who want to participate with me, and and try to reach out to uh, the uh, different uh, uh, members of the parliament in different countries uh, to to pressure uh, to get this pressure on them. It's a, it's a very important issue because, uh, just take the trade. It's so expensive. And even though we, we will be flooded with cannabis, all the vats, all the fees, all everything, it will be so expensive for the patient still. So that's, but when everything is okay, also with the EU, my job is finished. Maybe it is. Uh, th- this is my case and this is my issue. I'm uh, not the, the one who's uh, going to sleep in, uh, in uh, some uh, authority uh, chief or uh, something uh, that's too boring. <laughs> so I'll take another issue. But it, it is also collect the people from different countries so everybody's re- uh, represented. Uh, and, uh, and if it's, uh, if, if it's uh, researchers or physicians or uh, somebody who has been in the industry for several years, the main point is that it still is a cooperation between industry patient and researchers and not just patient and researchers. Because if you lock out the industry, you're lost already. Still, the area is so small and the, the industry has many things to, to come with. They've been in this business in so many years and so know about medical cannabis. Well, we've got time for one more question, so if you'd like to, I think it would be nice to end on a fun one. Okay, fun one, fun one. <laughs> if you could make one left field prediction for European cannabis this year, oh, God. something that you can really foresee happening that's going to shake things up, what's it going to be? It's so hard to predict this, this area. I think uh, some industry uh, uh, have already realized that uh, it's a, if you want to get it to the pharmaceutical area, life science area, where I wanted to go to, you have to do certain things. 
uh, I think there will be a realization in the, in the whole industry. And the, there will be some buyouts because right now it's a, it's not a mess. It's just a hype. And, uh, yeah, like we have seen in the ET, uh, industry and, and so on. Buyouts, buyouts, buyouts. Well, the buyout stories would be interesting to hear, but that's all we've got time for. Thank you for being such a wonderful guest. Yeah, thank you too. <laughs> Where do they go? The smoke rings I blow each night. Oh, what do they do? Those circles of blue and white. Well, listeners, we hope you enjoyed that episode and we'll for sure have more interviews with pioneers in European cannabis later in the series. But for now, please do like, share, subscribe, leave us a nice comment and uh, Oscar might get me a present. That's all for now. 